Well, good morning. Uh, it's delightful to see all of you here in person, and a good morning to all of you. Well, I guess it's good afternoon because you might be watching this on a Sunday afternoon, um, but a good day to all of you who are worshiping um, from home. Uh, this morning, yeah, this is the first Sunday with restrictions being lifted in quite a big way. Um, so I don't have to give you a big rigmarole at the beginning about what you can and can't do just out of, um, because there isn't any law against it now. Um, so uh, what we do recommend is that just out of consideration uh, for others, if you're, if you're comfortable with it and okay with it, um, just wear a mask when you're singing perhaps, uh, like we did in the fall, um, and then when you leave again. Uh, but other than that, Let's worship. Uh, and um, you may notice that things look a little bit different. The pulpit is missing. Uh, some of you back at home might be like, why is the pulpit not here? Uh, and that is because uh, this Sunday, things are going to be a little bit different. Um, I forgot to tell you in the past couple weeks that I was coming up on taking a Regent uh, College course this past week. So this week, past week, I was in school uh, all week. I had 15 hours of lecture and a whole bunch of reading. And, um, and so in place of a sermon, um, Errol Nadeau, our own Errol Nadeau, is going to do a little interview, um, kind of probing what kinds of things I learnt in the course, just to, as an opportunity to share with you, um, kind of more directly, uh, what happened in that. So that's why this is here, so we can kind of whisk it out of the way, and there's stools here behind me. A um, couple other special announcements. The first and most exciting one, absolutely, I think, is that... Uh, our uh, Donna Armstrong's daughter Amanda had her baby uh, at about one in the morning and um, uh, they have named the baby Vanessa she was uh, six pounds and 13 ounces uh, when she was born both mom and daughter are doing well and um, God protected them uh, she had to go in for a c-section because the baby was flipped the wrong way around and that kind of a thing so uh, but it all went very smoothly and they're now uh, resting and carrying on so we want to give great celebration for God really protecting both mother and child even though there were some risks um, so thanks to God for that um, also um, uh, for another thing I forgot to announce more frequently beforehand is uh, that we are going to have some outdoor adventure times on Saturday evenings. Uh, so if you're a family with kids or uh, friends of families with kids, <laughs> um, we are going to have something out on the north lawn right beside the upper church at 6 p.m. on Saturdays, kind of throughout the summer. It's going to be very simple and casual, kind of a probably a couple songs, uh, a few games for the kids, and hanging out. And this year, um, uh, we don't have to, now that the restrictions are lifted, we don't actually have to do the whole RSVPing thing, and you're free to invite more widely. Um, we don't have to be shy. So um, if you want to come out, or if you have friends that you want to bring with you, uh, come and hang out at about 6 p.m. on Saturday. Um, and I think that's all I have to announce. So, let's begin. Oh, wait, one more. Yes. Yes. What's the announcement that I missed? Oh, well, I can announce that. Sorry, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't read the bulletin. <gasps> I, thought, I thought I knew all of the announcements, uh, but apparently I don't. So there is, look at this, in the bulletin, it says there's a weeding work party. I'm sure this is in your Sunday email too, for those of you at home. Uh, please join your Building and Grounds Committee for a work party to rid the All Saints Yard of pesky weeds. Um, so that's going to be at 9 a.m. on Friday, July 9th. That's this Friday. So that is good Oops, to make that announcement right now because I can't make it next week. <laughs> so thank you. Thanks, Lynn, and thanks, Lana, for organizing that. All right, now we're going to start, unless there's further <laughs> things for people to say. Uh, this morning, our call to worship comes from Psalm 132, just the first several verses. Um, so I'm going to read those to you. It says, Lord, remember David and all of his self-denial. For he swore an oath to the Lord. He made a vow to the mighty one of Jacob that I will not enter my house or go to my bed. I will allow no sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord 
a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. We heard it in Ephrathah. We came upon it in the fields of Ja'ar. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool, saying, Arise, O Lord, and come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. May your priests be clothed with your righteousness, and may your faithful people sing for joy. Would you please bow with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this image that you gave in a very tangible way with your presence coming into the midst of your people through the symbol of the ark in the center of your temple. And Father, we thank you that now through your son, Jesus Christ, you have made us, your people, into your temple and that you come to us not in a wooden, symbolized by a wooden box, uh, but you actually come into our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit because of the work that was done by your son, Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we ask that you would remind us of that as we worship you this morning, that your presence is with us and in us, and we pray that you would stir our hearts to praise you as we sing. Amen. So we're going to sing. Uh, we're going to, um, and you're allowed to sing. <laughs> so please stand with me. We're going to sing hymn number 596. This is hymn number 596, I Surrender All. Please be seated. And would you now please bow with me as we pray. Merciful God, 
We confess to you now that we have sinned. We confess the sins that no one knows and the sins that everyone knows. We confess the sins that burden us and the sins that do not bother us because we've gotten used to them. We confess our sins as a church, that we have not loved one another as Christ has loved us, and that we have not given ourselves in love and service for the world as Christ gave himself. Father, we ask that you would forgive us, that in your mercy you would send your Holy Spirit to us to give us the power to live as by your mercy you have called us to live. And we ask this through our merciful Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So as you have come this morning to God in a willingness to turn to him and to be open and honest in your confession, may you now experience the fulfillment of his promises in these moments and in the moments to come. Because the apostle Paul was inspired by God to declare to us, saying, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin. Amen. All right. Um, we are now going to continue to worship in song. I invite the worship team to come forward. And so this is uh, the time of the prayers of our community. So this is our opportunity to bring before God our requests and thanksgivings um, and any words of encouragement we might have received from the Lord. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. And uh, feel free to please at this time, just from where you're seated, raise your hand and share any prayer requests or concerns uh, or thanksgivings you may have. All right, let's pray. Would you please bow with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you as your children, unafraid and unashamed to ask, because through your Son, Jesus Christ, you have made a way that we can be adopted into your family and that you have made us co-heirs with him and children that we, you delight in despite the fact that we don't deserve it. So we thank you for the forgiveness that brings us into this place where we can speak openly and freely before you and know that you hear us. So Lord, we want to start by giving thanks to you for the return of some cooler temperatures. We thank you um, for bringing us safely through that heat wave last weekend and back into something more normal uh, for summer. Lord, we also want to give you thanks um, just for the great love that you have shown us through Christ that enables us to examine ourselves and be able to say no to other things without feelings of despair because we know that if you ask us to say no to something that you are the one who loves us enough and provides for us so that we can endure through those times and so Lord we thank you for your great love for us that gives us the freedom um, to begin to say no to things in our lives that are not healthy um, and so, Lord, we pray that you'd continue to help us do that as we grow in you. Lord, we also want to lift up to you, Father, in prayer, uh, the residents of the town of Lytton, B.C., as this town was destroyed in fire this past week, and at least two people have died. We pray for the grief of loss, um, especially for the loss of life, and we also pray for grief of the loss of home, and what a, what a hard thing that is, uh, so many of them just losing everything. Father, we pray um, that you would, first of all, provide for them. But, Father, we also pray that you'd comfort them uh, by your power of your spirit and through the good news of your gospel. Lord, we also want to lift up our indigenous brothers and sisters. We thank you um, for the beautiful people that they are. And, Father, we grieve um, the ways that they have been harmed, um, often at our hands. 
And Father, we grieve, especially now that um, our own ignorance is doing it again. As there are churches that have been burned um, and people don't even realize that indigenous people go to those churches. And so, Father, we pray that you'd be with those people who would have been back worshiping in a building like this, um, but now too have no shelter physically. So we thank you, Father, that our brothers and sisters in Christ always have the shelter of you, our God. And we pray for an outpouring of compassion on them through your spirit and through the hands of your church. Lord, we also want to pray for the growing number of people in our congregation, and I would imagine in our city, who have, are being displaced um, by the selling of buildings that used to be rental situations um, and are having to look for a new place to rent in a, in a market that's very difficult. So, Father, we pray that your guiding hand would be with them, that you would find them good places to live, um, and that you'd have compassion on them, and that if they are at all in need, Lord, you would help us to provide um, and just be the church. And we pray this in your name. And so now at this time, God, we give you thanks um, that you have heard our prayers. And at this time in faith, we now lay all these things at your feet, trusting that you will do what is good. And Heavenly Father, we pray that we would now be able to be confident in your faithfulness and goodness to us as we go. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So youth, if you want to head out, you can do that. And the rest of us, we're going to respond by singing, Hear Our Prayer, O Lord. It's on the back of your bulletin if you want the words. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Incline thine ear to us and grant us thy peace. Amen. All right, I'd like to invite Errol to come up and read scripture for us. Good morning. Scripture reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 to 11. Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But, since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife, and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all of you were as I am, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. This is the word of the Lord. So grant, 
Yes. I get to interview you this you morning. You do. <laughs> in place of a sermon. In place, you get to put me on the spot, yes. <laughs> <laughs> You've chosen an interesting interview topic, goodness and the problem with normal. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know, I didn't realize that there was a problem with normal. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll be getting into that. <laughs> so I'll be listening. <laughs> But before we start, let me say a prayer. For you. Thank you. Holy God, the topic this morning is challenging. We ask that by your Spirit, you will prepare our hearts to receive what you wish us to receive, and that our conversation will reflect the love you have for each person you have created to your greater glory. Amen. Amen. So I understand you're taking a Regent course yes. this week. Yeah. What were you studying? Yeah, so the course I was taking this week um, was uh, taught by a guy named Wesley Hill, and the title of the course was Reordering Desire, and then the subtitle was Augustine, Queer Theory, and Sexual Ethics. So, yeah, that was the name of the course I was taking. <laughs> okay. I checked the Regent syllabus this summer yep. for the summer, and I noticed that they're offering over 30 courses. Yes. What made you choose this one? Yeah, very good question. Um, because um, in a lot of ways, it's something that's, uh, you know, uh, difficult and challenging to address and oftentimes gets ignored. Um, you know, we just don't talk about sexual ethics a lot because... You know, in our culture, what you do with your body is very sensitive and, um, and seen as, and it is very deeply personal. And um, one of the real attractions to me in taking this course uh, wasn't so much the title, but the person who was teaching it. So it was taught by um, a guy named Wesley Hill, um, who has been same-sex attracted his whole life. He's 40 now. He's about the same age as me. And... Um, uh, he has no ever had any experience of being erotically attracted to a female. He's only been erotically attracted to other men. Um, and, uh, and yet he holds what we would, would often be called a traditionalist position. He uh, thinks that it's good news uh, that uh, marriage is only between uh, a man and a woman. And so that was intriguing to me because <laughs> in a lot of my experience, it's, uh, you know, a lot of people that I know who experience the same thing he experiences uh, don't see that as good news. And, um, and so I was very, very curious to hear his point of view. Um, and also especially to just, yeah, and it was just, you know, reinforced, I think, when he mentioned a few things right at the beginning of the course about how deeply personal this is to him. Um, and the fact that this is an issue that too often gets sidetrack to be about, um, you know, principles and like stuff that's kind of off in the air and loses focus on the fact that it is about people. And he narrated even in his own life a significant point for himself where, um, you know, he had kind of just, in a sense, ignored it himself. He tried to like fight it his, all the way through until his college years. He was raised in a Christian home. And... Um, and then when he was in university, he was having a conversation with a girl um, who had struggled with depression and who had felt like she had kind of come to a new breakthrough in her life in dealing with her depression. And she said this to him. She said, um, you know, Wesley, um, ignoring is not the path to redeeming. Um, Ignoring is not the path to the redeeming, that you can't just ignore something and expect things to get better. And, um, and then she, he also quoted at the end, of course, this really interesting quote by an, uh, uh, a woman who would, who's Catholic, uh, who would also hold a traditional position but would describe herself as lesbian. Her name is Eve Tushnet. And, um, and she, you know, her experience, she says, most uh, young gay people today, uh, when they come to church, they experience a catechism. That's, you know, basic teachings of the church. They experience a catechism of silence. In other words, the church doesn't tell them anything about what to do with the experiences that they're having. 
And um, as people then, she says, who are called, what we do tell them is no, uh, oftentimes. Um, but as people who are called two things, two pathways, vocations in God's sight, she says, um, you can't have a vocation of no. And uh, I found that also powerful. So that's where Wesley Hill's coming from, and that's really the reason why I wanted to take the course is because I wanted to hear what he had to say. So you want to hear what Wesley Hill had to say? Yes, I did. What did Wesley Hill have to say? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, Wesley's main goal in this course uh, was to try and essentially reframe the conversation on how churches talk about sexual ethics and specifically um, marriage uh, when it comes to, you know, same sex or not. Um, what do you do? Um, and so he feels that there is, there's a lot of problems with using language like affirming, um, not saying that he doesn't still hold to his traditional position, but uh, he has problems with that, and he feels that uh, looking and listening uh, to people who would describe themselves as queer or queer theorists, uh, and listening to a guy named Augustine, or Augustine, if you, depending on where you, how you pronounce his name, um, actually gives a lot of light on how to, re, how to talk about this in a more Christian way. Mm. Um, so that's kind of his goal is to try and reframe the conversation so that it's, uh, yeah, just m more Christian and healthier. So, it, okay, well, I'll say one more thing before you ask me this question. <laughs> and that is, his one line that he kept saying over and over is that um, the, the way, how you get to the conclusion you get to is just as important as the conclusion you get to. The way you talk about this, um, it has a big impact on people. You mentioned something called queer theory. Yes, queer theory. <laughs> what is queer theory? Very good question. Um, so queer theory, and he took about two days to kind of unpack this, so I'm not going to be able to, you know, do it justice. Uh, but one helpful thing he gave that's short is that he gave a definition by a queer theorist, a guy named Michael Warner. And Michael Warner uh, defines queer in this way. He says queer is resistance, and each of these words is important, resistance to the regimes of the normal. So in other words, it's the idea that in a setting, um, you know, even unconsciously as society's norms where certain things or groups are considered normative or normal and other things are not, creates often unintentionally regimes, places in which uh, there are people who are treated poorly or oppressed is the language that they probably use um, because of these norms and therefore these norms what's normal has to be resisted you have to kind of do stuff to mess with that so that you don't get these pockets of people that are considered abnormal that would be their big concern um, in and it's a subgroup of what you was called critical theory so you may have heard in the news there's lots of stuff about critical race theory out there right now this is the same family of things so if you hear people talking about queer theory it's under the same big umbrella. Okay. Yeah. So now I'm beginning to get a sense that there is a problem with normal. Uh, yeah, especially from the queer point of view. Right? He's wanting to listen to that and say that there's, yeah, he's going to have... But what does queer theory have to do with Christianity? Right. Yes. So queer theory and Christianity uh, for the connection with that um, he goes and he wants to recover um, uh, the teaching of the Bible and he feels that one of the easiest ways to do that is to go to a very famous Bible teacher whose name was Saint Augustine. Um, so just to unpack a little bit, Saint Augustine or Augustine, uh, however you hear that, uh, it's differently pronounced if you're from the UK or America. Um, he lived in kind of the turn of the third to fourth century, so the late 300s, early 400s AD and um, he uh, also had, he wouldn't have framed it this way, but he had big concerns with normal. <laughs> and this is where he wants to tie in. Uh, of course, Augustine wouldn't have used those language. He is the one who actually coined the phrase original sin. And Augustine's point 
and he takes it from scripture. He looks at places like, you know, Romans, the famous, you know, all have fallen short of the glory of God. And also in uh, Genesis, where it says even after the flood, talking about just Noah and his family, um, the problem still remained that God still declared that of Noah and his family, that even still, after all this, uh, the thoughts of humankind was only evil all the time, the inclinations, their desires. And so Augustine wants to um, draw this picture where, in a sense, if we used queer, queer theorist language, uh, that there is no normal right now. The only normal that ever existed was before the fall, or what's going to happen in the future after God restores all things, and there's only one exception in the present, or in our age, and that is the person of Jesus Christ. If we want to look at someone as normative, as normal, um, the only person we can look to is Christ. So he's saying essentially that, um, you know, when you were talking about the subject of marriage, normal, uh, you know, you don't want to even be calling what happens sexually inside a marriage normal because that is twisted by desires that are not the way God planned them to be. So uh, he would have a very different name for that. He would call them passions. And by that, he doesn't mean just emotional. He actually believed that Jesus was the most emotional person and that Jesus is the only one who can really be described as having emotions. Uh, everyone else has passions, which means that they have loves, but they're loves that have been kind of disordered. They're not quite aimed at where they should be, which Augustine would say is towards God. So that's kind of this connection of Augustine's criticalness of looking at anything in nature, anything inside of ourselves, and saying, that's normal. Augustine, like a queer theorist, would have big problems with that. So that's the connection that Wesley Hill saw between uh, Augustine's writings and queer theory. Do you want to expand on that? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, the biggest difference, of course, between them is not total agreement, uh, is that, uh, you know, Wesley would point out, and it's very obvious if you read writings from both, that the answer that's pointed to is very different. Um, so, yes, they agree about the kind of the fallenness, and that's, I guess, the real attraction uh, from Wesley's point of view is this view of the fallenness of humankind that has been so strongly denied in our society for so long. And queer theorists are actually like, no, we think the world's really fallen, uh, that there's things really wrong. Um, the, the difficulty we would have as Christians with some of the answers that they put forward is that their answers are extremely pessimistic, that they don't believe, you know, that there's, you can really get to a place where it'll all be good. Um, you know, the best you can kind of do is for lack of a better metaphor, this isn't his metaphor, but mine is keep tipping the boat. You know, anytime somebody gets up, a bunch of group of people get in the boat and call themselves normal and see themselves as superior, then the rest of us are supposed to tip the boat and bring them back in the water with the rest of us. And then we'll kind of, you know, um, that might not be, you know, the, it's just a simple way of doing it. You know, it, it's kind of this idea that um, we got to keep tipping the boat, so to speak. Whereas Augustine would see it very different. He would see that there is real hope um, and that real hope comes from the love of God. And so that's what he would say is that our problem is with our loves, that we love things that either that we shouldn't love or we love the things that we should love in the wrong way. And what we need then to overcome those things is a greater love. And that comes to us from God through Jesus Christ. Um, and his love for us in Christ is so great that it actually gives us the opportunity to really change. Because unlike modern times today, I think in modern views, uh, we would start with our thinking, you know, we would try and think through an issue. And then once we've settled out our thoughts on the issue, we would try and like say like, okay, that's gonna mean I'm gonna make decisions, I'm gonna control my will in certain ways. And I'm gonna do that, you know, even if uh, I have emo different weird conflicting emotions about it, you know. Um, Augustine would say the exact opposite. He says, you never do that. He says, no one ever does that. Everyone loves stuff, and what you love controls what you do, and then all of your thinking is simply to rationalize what you do. And so the real answer is that we need to have, be overcome with a love that is greater 
that are loved so that we actually love God more than we love everything else. And that gives us the opportunity to say no to certain things even when we love them. And this is the key that he would see. Augustine would use a term called ascesis, ascetic, which means kind of denial. But what he's really getting after, or we would talk about as discipleship, is that it gets us to the point when God overcomes us with his love and we love him with a greater love that we can actually willingly say no to some of the things that we love and not feel disgruntled about it. We can feel like, no, this is a better path um, and that this is a calling for all Christians. So in a sense, it's getting a better idea of what we should love. Yes, uh, that's the opening to Augustine's Confessions. His book, uh, that's probably the most famous, is, uh, you know, he asks the Lord right at the beginning of that book, um, you know, that he says that our hearts are restless until we find our rest in you, O God. So cover us, you know, shower us with your love so that our hearts might be turned fully towards you. Uh, and this is what is meant by the reordering our desire. It's not getting rid of competing desires uh, and necessarily flipping those. That may be God's choice in certain circumstances, but it's often not. God often leaves us with those desires still in place, but he kind of overwhelms them with uh, love for God. Thank you. So how is this relevant for Christian se sexual ethics? Yeah, that's right. Uh, so uh, with Christian sexual ethics, uh, and. Um, the connection point is really that um, is trying to, uh, as Wesley said it, it's trying to be serious about the Christian cliche phrase of that every, all the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And uh, the critique that um, both Augustine and I think Quirithius would make of churches, and I think churches like ours, is that we call sex inside of marriage normal. We think that it's kind of, we don't, we don't necessarily think this way, but we treat it that way. We treat marriage as the norm. And therefore, anything that doesn't fall within that is automatically under deep suspicion, but marriage itself is never under suspicion. And he thinks that, no, 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 we should be more critical of how we think of marriage. Uh, and that will actually have positive benefits for conversation with um, people who are in different situations. Um, because if you think about it, even within marriage, you know, there's still a lot of, um, you know, and sex within marriage, there's still shame. You know, we feel shame in those certain situations. We, we, there's pain and brokenness. There's um, all sorts of things that are clearly not how God intended it to be in the garden. There's selfishness. And even though there's goodness still there, um, it's not the point isn't to affirm that whatever happens inside of a marriage, well, that's good, you know, nor is it to affirm an idea that, well, if you just have same-sex desires, I mean, opposite to sex desires, that's good. Because clearly, according to Scripture, that's not good necessarily either. Like, if somebody is promiscuous and has sexual desires for a whole bunch of different people, that's clearly not accord good according. So to call something like heterosexuality, for example, normal is problematic for Christians because it's not normal according to the norm that God would set, right? He would want us, in, you know, if you are married, you're supposed to, you know, be focused on one person, not on anybody who happens to be of that gender. Uh, and so those are kind of the things that um, it's being kind of critical of marriage in such a way that we all see ourselves on the, on the same ground, that everyone has um, sexual desires that are not the norm. They're not normal. And therefore, we need to have God's help in what do we do with those? And so the framing, this is the reframing that he's talking about. The reframing then is that we're all, um, we all have twisted desires. They were intended originally good, but they've been turned. And we're all in need of them uh, to be reordered. This is the idea. And therefore, we need... Um, pathways to do this, ways of living. And he says that the two sanctioned ways that we find in Scripture for reordering our desires in a lived out way are the pathways of celibacy, or we might call it singleness uh, today, celibacy and uh, marriage between a man and a woman. And he would say that that's the path. No matter where you are at the other thing, we all need to be reshaped. Um, but these are the pathways and that 
For everyone, that involves saying no to things that we truly do love in our hearts. As a married person, it means saying no to all sorts of selfishness and other stuff, and you can find that it's a very much a purifying experience as a, in the Christian vision of being married. Um, and as single people, you know, there's of course things that you have to say no to, but that there's a real value um, to doing that. It's really important and, and it's not just a, well, sorry for you, you know, like, uh, happy for all those people who are married, but ah, oh, just dumping on people who aren't married. And that's kind of the problem with normal, in a nutshell, yeah. is treating marriage as our norm. Whether you want it to or not, it dumps on people who are single, whether they're same-sex attracted or just people who haven't had the opportunity to get married. So how would you suggest we apply this reframing yeah. to the question of same-sex marriage? Yeah, so he would say that, um, you know, uh, it's a question then of, of giving um, kind of this opportunity um, for people who are struggling with these kinds of things not to feel kind of rejected and isolated and separate and to be just ignored because that often is the thing is that if we see it this way we don't have to ignore we can use actually our own difficulties if you're married in your own situation uh, to really be open and, and minister you know I think one of the examples he talked about was um, you know people who are married and end up not having children and who you know over the course of that experience uh, he mentions a book, um, I can't remember the name of it right now, but uh, well, it's narrated by this one couple who went through it and their, how it kind of cleansed their idea of what marriage even is. You know, that my, our primary identity isn't in our children and we can say no to that. And, uh, and how helpful that it is to understanding the importance of being single in the Christian worldview because what he would also argue, and Augustine argues this as well, is that you know, marriage in Christianity, as we're all, or most of us are aware, is not just like a contract. It's also a symbol of the gospel. You know, in Ephesians 5, uh, Paul talks about, you know, um, the relationship between a husband and a wife as modeling the love of Christ for the church. Um, and what both Augustine and Wes Hill would argue is that they point out that there's also a symbol for celibacy, that Paul didn't just have like a symbol for married people, he had a symbol for single people, like him, uh, that singleness was about more than just avoiding sin. Uh, and that symbolism, when he talks about, in light of the end times, he says, when he talks about celibacy, that it's a hint, he would say, Augustine and the others, that s being single is a sign, a radical sign of faith in the resurrection. Um, the fact that I'm saying no to the rat race of having kids and trying to, through my kids, like prolong my name. And you can think about, especially in the ancient Roman world, it's such, such a big deal. Like for someone to not have an heir and deliberately choose to not have an heir, I mean, people would be like, what are you doing? Like you're crazy. Uh, and they were saying, well, this is because of my faith in the gospel. And this would be why, you know, um, Augustine and others would argue that um, celibacy is actually a better symbol in the present because of the resurrection than marriage is. And you'll hear Paul talk about this, about I wish that everyone were like me. It's like if you didn't have, you know, struggles with sexual purity, uh, I wish you were like me so that you could be this symbol too. And that's what's the gift of... Thanks for explaining that. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of this kind of um, missionary view of the calling of signal, singleness. It's not just to know, it's to... It's a big yes to uh, being a display of the gospel. Um, so you asked me to watch the time. Yeah, we're probably running out of time. I've, I've been doing that. <laughs> <laughs> time. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll give you grace yeah. and ask if you have any other thoughts you want to leave with us. Yeah, I think, um, I think you know, the, the most important thing, I think, is uh, just this... Um, you know, especially if you're married, uh, this recognition of like being careful about how you talk about marriage and married sex uh, as being, you know, it, I, you know, I don't know if you were in youth group as a kid, I was, and I definitely heard youth pastors being like, you know, like just save yourself till marriage. 
And then when you get into marriage, married life, you know, God will reward you and sex will be awesome. And it's this kind of like this idea that if you save yourself, then inside marriage, and of course, many married people have, you know, believed this and gone and been like, what are you talking about? Awesome. This is hard. This is like, there's a lot of things that, you know, just we're missing each other, you know, and uh, it's not working out smoothly. And it's this big thing. But that's this huge shift of mentality is that in our church culture, we've had this view of marriage as being the opportunity for the indulgence. That marriage means I get to indulge in kind of the sexual fantasies that I've always wanted to have. I think of a, uh, when I was working at Earl's, this one guy I heard, you know, young guy, he was getting married, I think at like 19 or something. And he was like, I'm so excited to get married because after I'm married, I'll get to have all the sex that I want whenever I want. And I was thinking to myself, like, whoa, I wasn't even married at the time. And I'm like, dude, you got a lot to learn. <laughs> like, and, you know, but that mentality and how selfish it is. It's so incredibly selfish. And that Christian marriage is not that. Christian marriage means that we, we all have desires like, like this young man, which are totally out of line with love. That is not real love. You know, love considers the other person before them themselves. And so marriage itself is this thing that, like, kind of, we have to like, you know, to love God, we have to say no to so many different things. It's this ascesis, this denial that has to happen. And in this kind of relationship, we have a lot in common, a, a huge amount in common with people who struggle with all sorts of different um, sexual things and are being asked to say no. Because even if you're married, you're going to be asked to say no to a lot of things. And that there's these, these two paths, though, are the paths that Scripture says, that God says, if you follow these paths, it will make you more Christ-like. It will make you, you know, if you follow it as a follower of Jesus, <laughs> that is, I should say, uh, it's going to be how I reshape you. And, um, yeah, I'm just stuck with that, I guess. Thank you, Grant. Thank you for exploring this area for us and, and helping us reframe our thinking. Yeah. Perhaps a little bit. Yeah. Perhaps not enough, but it's a start. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks, Errol, for doing this. And actually, if you mind, why don't we just pray at the closing? Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we, we thank you especially for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, the one normal human being, that, Father, that you have not left us without a guide, that we are not in the situation that so many people who would call themselves queer theorists think that we're in, that we're in a situation that is horribly unjust and we have, we have no standards. Uh, Father, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, so to teach us first and foremost and bring us into a relationship with love with you where we might have our hearts reordered so that we might become people who have experienced such an incredible love through you that we love you and your ways more than all the different directions that our hearts want to pull us. And so Heavenly Father, uh, we just pray that you would help us in that, that you would make our love for you greater so that even as we say no to some really hard things to say no to in our lives, um, that we would still find joy in that because we know uh, it's done out of love for you. And so we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to sing a hymn. Um, I will look at what it is. It is hymn number 324 when I survey the wondrous cross. Would you stand with me?
now, my brothers and sisters in Christ, may you go in the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the knowledge that his love is greater. And may you open yourselves to his love so that in loving him in return, we might be open to his reordering of our lives, that we might be able to say no to things he would ask us to say no to, and yet still find joy in that because of his great love for us. So whether you're married or you're single, know that you are a living symbol of the good news of Jesus Christ. In married relationship, it's the love of Christ in his church. In your single lives, you are a sign to the world of God's overcoming of death through the resurrection. May you go now and follow whatever God has called to you at this time and in this place. Amen.